Okay, thank you uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, of course, thank you everyone of you uh, for, for attending today. Um, so the topic of my talk will be the creation of an ontology to represent heraldic imagery on painted walls and ceilings. And uh, the general goal is to utilize this ontology for data-driven analyses on questions about how and for what purposes such Im imagery was, uh, was used over time. And uh, I will discuss the modeling process for the ontology and especially some modeling decisions which I consider relevant for, um, for representing images on three-dimensional material objects in the context of, of our iconography. And ooh, that doesn't sound, okay. Um, so, but first I would like to give you a quick overview on the historical domain we are talking about. And um, as Thorsten Hildmann already said, on the context of the project my work is situated in. So I work as the research uh, assistant in uh, Thorsten Hildmann's project, uh, which is called Codes of Arms in Practice. And uh, the general object of this project is to achieve a better understanding of the function and development of heraldry as a source of cultural history. So heraldry was a system of science that originated in the high middle ages and that was widely employed, employed on different sources and in different material contexts. Um, here you can see um, only a few examples like manuscripts, seals, murals, furniture or tablecloths. And um, in historical studies, uh, codes of arms were traditionally mainly employed as a tool for dating and identifying historical sources. But there's also a decade long uh, established branch of research that uh, points out the usage of codes of arms as sources of cultural history as, um, as an important tool for visual communication, especially. And as such a tool, heraldry was uh, employed by nearly all actors of pre-modern European societies. Codes of arms could be used to identify persons or groups, offices, territories, or even abstract ideas. Um, they could also convey meaning by projecting influence, lawful rights, or be used as as a visual proxy to mark the presence of something or someone which uh, or who was absent. Uh, so in short, they functioned as a central tool for visual communication throughout the Middle Ages and during the early modern era. And therefore, we need to consider codes of arms as an important source for cultural history. And since heraldry was as commonly and widely used as it was, we are dealing with a huge quantity of sources. There are estimates of about 1 million different codes of arms for the Middle Ages alone. And at the same time, it is of course, of course important to keep track of which codes of arms were reused in which material, temporal, and societal contexts. This is also important since the same code of arms that was being used on different objects at different times, um, the, the same code of arms could mean a different thing in each of these contexts. So these contexts are necessary to be able to interpret, to interpret heraldry as a historical source at all. And because of this complexity, we are um, approaching this with digital methods in, in, the, in the project. Uh, firstly, to capture and link all of these sources, but secondly, also to employ data-driven research methods. And my task uh, in, in this project is, in short, to design a knowledge graph with semantic web te technologies that does exactly, exa exactly that. And, uh, a knowledge graph, uh, of course, being a graph database that uses its nodes and relations to represent knowledge, uh, human knowledge, but in a machine readable way. And uh, an important part of my work is the creation of an ontology to formally describe single codes of arms, um, which is possible because heraldry as a system of science relies on the continuous reuse of, of a set of geometric patterns and uh, figures and colors. and uh, yeah, but here I have to point out that an important feature of our knowledge graph will be the separation of the description of the codes of arms and the, the actor or thing the code of arms uh, represents and the context it is used in. Because as I pointed out before, the same code of arms could be used in different contexts, but the same code of arms could also be used by different actors. So we need to have at least these three layers or ontological uh, modules in a technical way to actually be able to, to use our data for meaningful historical research. And such data can then be reused by other historians, art historians, historical uh, auxiliary scientists or archivists to, to, to name just a few possibilities aside from the research questions uh, we are working on in, in this particular project. <clears throat> 
Um, but this general perspective will not be the topic of my presentation today. Rather, I would uh, like to discuss with you elements of my PhD thesis that I'm working on also in the context of this project. And here I'm focusing on heraldic painted walls and ceilings or murals as a particular type of source. And as you can see here, uh, heraldry was used as a form of decor on painted walls and painted ceilings. And you can also see that uh, there are particular types of murals where coats of arms make up an important part of the iconographic program itself. Um, for example, there are murals displaying about a, only a dozen coats of arms, but uh, there are also ones where you can find about 100 of them. And uh, this begs, of course, the question of why heraldry was used in such a way and um, as a part of architecture and uh, how heraldry functioned in such cases as a means for visual communication. And uh, as I pointed out before, how we can answer such questions is heavily dependent on the particular context or rather on multiple contexts. For example, where can, where can um, such uh, examples be found? In what kind of buildings and in which regions and, uh, and territories? Who commissioned uh, these, these images and who were such paintings intended to have an effect on? And of course, how did all this change and develop over time? And also who or what was displayed by these single coats of arms? And are there visual structures to be identified uh, to which I will come later? Um, but now just to make this uh, a, little, a little more concrete, um, if you are not studying this field, uh, I would uh, like to take a look uh, at, a, at two quick examples with you. Uh, the first is a room in the so-called Haus zum Brunnenhof in uh, Zurich. And uh, the wall painting was probably created around th um, 1330. And um, what you can see here uh, on the colored image is just a part of the whole mural. And as you can see on the, on the drawing, the whole painting stretches over multiple parts of the room. And this painting was most likely commissioned by a rich Jewish family of the, of the town. This is notable in this case, since this painting adapts particular fashions which were quite common in wall paintings of the Christian patrician elites of this time. The members of the Jewish family, the probable commissioners of this particular mural, um, were most likely killed by burning along nearly all other Jews in Zurich during a pogrom, uh, which followed the bubonic plague uh, epidemic of 1348. And also in light of this situation, a possible interpretation of this would be that, or of this mural would be that the commissioners of the, of the painting used it to define themselves as members of the urban elite of Zurich. Um, the room here this mural belongs to was most likely intended uh, as a room where the family received their clients, but also as a space for festive occasions. And therefore, the wall painting would be intended to be seen by Christians, as well as by other members of the Jewish community in the city alike. So this could mean that the coats of arms served as a symbolic proxy for noble members of, a, of the Christian elite. And through their coats of arms, these people were virtually present in the room. And the Jewish clients therefore depicted them, them, themselves as uh, among members of, of this elite when they were, were receiving guests in their house. Mm -hmm. And another example uh, is the so-called Pan Hall, um, which is in the castle of Urach in today's southwestern Germany. Uh, this was probably commissioned in the context of a wedding around 1474. And this year, uh, Eberhard IV, the Duke of Württemberg, uh, married Barbara of Mantua. And uh, the coats of arms uh, depicted by this wall painting represent the ancestral and territorial ties of the Duke of Württemberg. So uh, the wall painting therefore serves here as a display of a particular genealogical program. And also um, this wall painting is at the same time a good example to illustrate why a, a linkage of heraldic sources, as I showed before, why a linkage of heraldic sources over multiple material source contexts can be helpful. Because as you can see here, uh, the, the same combination of, um, of coats of arms as in the palm hall was also used in in this manuscript, um, here also focusing on, on, on family ties. Mm. So <clears throat> as you can see, with um, these two examples, we encounter multiple use cases and societal contexts of such painted walls. They were used by the nobility as well by, as by uh, urban elites, um, but there are also uh, other 
possibilities uh, we are not diving into now. So uh, you can see um, we have a variety of aspects regarding the historical context to consider when we want to understand uh, such um, monuments. And uh, my own work now on such heraldic murals is based on the same research traditions as the main project. So I regard heraldry as a historical visual source in itself, and I employ a data-driven approach to describe and to analyze these sources. And um, the goal is to get a general overview of on this type of source from the 13th to the 16th century, centering on France and the German speaking areas. So therefore my work uh, for my PhD project consists of creating a corpus of such wall paintings and designing an ontology to describe and represent these sources. And there already exist a few database, uh, databases and, um, and analog catalogs uh, collecting such painted walls and ceilings that as such heavily feature uh, heraldic decor. There's, for example, uh, Arma, um, which is a French database for the regions of Brittany, Ile de France, and uh, Poitou, um, of which uh, people who created this are present here at the moment. Thank you for coming. Um, so um, the fact uh, that we already have data on this, this means uh, an important part of my work uh, is to homogenize different metadata models, uh, different schemas to describe heraldic painted walls and to bring them together into a single general ontology on this, uh, on this topic. And uh, this ontology must, of course, represent the murals in the historical context, but also be able to represent their iconographic programs themselves. Only then can we obtain a better understanding on how the murals work as visual items. And um, the results of this can be considered as a critical addition in the classical sense, so to speak, but has, of course, the additional challenge that we are here dealing with three-dimensional objects, not the two-dimensional pages of, 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 of books or of fields. So um, finally, and most importantly for my dissertation, the knowledge graph uh, I will create is intended to be used as a basis to answer the research questions on this topic we started with. And this can only be done in a data-driven way because of the amount of uh, sources we have. And uh, therefore, because of this, an additional contri contribution of my PhD th thesis will be the, the exploration and evaluation of data-driven methods to analyze knowledge graphs. So uh, the aim is to employ knowledge graph data for distant viewing, so to speak. And um, methods to analyze knowledge graphs do already exist, but they are only very rarely up to this point used in historical studies. So therefore, we need to think about how to integrate such methods into our methods of uh, or on historical source criticism. But um, this is only the next step. So in this talk, I will now elaborate more on the ontology itself that is um, intended to, to, to make all of this possible. Mm. But um, before we dive into the specific structure and modeling principles of designing an ontology to analyze heroic murals in context, I would uh, like to give you a quick overview on the design process itself. So in general, the goal of an ontology is, of course, to provide a tool for querying complex and heterogeneous data based on domain-specific questions. Consequently, designing as well as maintaining an ontology is always an interdisciplinary effort, since in the end, all experts from the re represented domain, in this case history, all experts from this domain should be able to answer their own research questions with an ontology. And not only people that also have a background in knowledge engineering should be able to use it. And uh, this is a challenge which is, exists uh, across all domains. Um, but it is, of course, something we as historians have to keep especially in mind at this moment uh, with regard to the ongoing cultural change in historical studies and our goal in raising awareness for data literacy and data culture in our disciplines. And with regard to these challenges, several methodologies for, for ontology design have emerged over the last two decades which we as historians should, should also adapt, I think. Um, so as a starting point for the modeling process, um, competency questions can be used. And uh, competency questions are informal research questions in natural language. And they are phrased from the perspective of domain expert, in this case, from the perspective of, of historians. And uh, the goal, of course, is to design an ontology that is able to accept queries that are represented uh, or that, that represent these competency questions. 
And uh, this step in, uh, in the modeling helps to ascertain which concepts an ontology has to represent, how detailed this representation has to be done, and how these concept, concepts have to be connected um, with, with each other. So now, step of creating competency questions helps to identify the specific requirements an ontology has to fulfill. And uh, to this need, I would also add the importance of competency questions as a tool to communicate results, um, results of the modeling process, as well as results from research done with an ontology. With regard to the aforementioned cultural change in historical studies, we should, as digital historians, of course, be interested, interested in communicating our research results to an audience of historians. But these historians do not always have a background in digital methods as well. So to successfully make our results available, they have to be com comprehensible for them and intellectually reproducible, at least to some degree. So the explicit conveyance of competency questions may help us with that since they provide a node of neutral communication between the purely technical and the purely historical domain. We can use them to make explicit what a model can and cannot do and what research questions it um, should be able to answer. So in our words, we are also making more transparent how our research questions, questions um, shaped the ontological model we, we developed. Okay, and uh, then as a next step after formulating such uh, queries in natural language, these um, questions uh, are used to extract the so-called key notions of the ontology. And these key notions are the central concepts an ontology then has to model. And um, since an ontology should ideally be as, and as interoperable as possible, this step in the design process is also used to identify which of the key notions can be represented to already existing modules. These modules can, for example, be taken from other ontologies that partly cover similar aspects of the same, uh, the same knowledge domain um, one wants to represent. I will elaborate on this in a minute. Um, so, but using these steps here as a starting point, we can then further refine the identified concepts and define relations between them at, that allow us to, to answer our research questions with the ontology, which is then the actual knowledge engineering work and um, um, ontology uh, designing. So um, in this talk, I would like to focus on the ontology itself and primarily discuss it with you from a perspective of knowledge engineering. And therefore, my own following competency questions, of course, just a part of all the ones which I use to define the whole ontology. Uh, they should just be understood as examples on which aspects are of interest to me and which are the main challenges in modeling an ontology of periodic murals. So the key notions uh, you can see here, are, um, or one can extract from these questions, are here set in the set and hold to make it more clear. So we could ask who is represented through the codes of arms displayed on a specific mural. And then you can see, okay, we need actors and codes of arms and murals as concept. And uh, what kind of buildings were uh, was heavily used as part of murals? And are there any aesthetic conventions to be identified? Are there specific ways in structuring iconographic elements on heraldic murals? And of course, does this change over time? And uh, this particular question means, um, is there a way iconographic elements were spatially depicted with regard to each other, which could then imply a symbolic meaning? We will come to that later as well. Um, but also lastly, uh, are certain conventions typical for specific actors, regions or functions of buildings? So I of course have to include uh, these concepts as well. And also, all of these questions can, of course, be combined with each, with each other. Um, the purpose here is to just to identify which concepts we need we need to model. Hmm. What may become evident now is that, um, that we are dealing here with multiple layers um, of the overall ontology. So each of these layers defines a certain aspect of what we would describe as part of the historical context of the periodic painted walls. So we have the description of coats of arms, um, the paintings themselves, the architecture is territorial context. And we should, of course, be able to also include data about the people and institutions that were represented by heraldry and who also commissioned uh, painted walls and ceilings. 
And uh, all of these layers should function as single ontologies and enable single queries. But more importantly, all layers should uh, be usable in a single query as well. So this is a general requirement and a general architecture. Um, and um, now these contexts, uh, which are these modules, the ontology is able to represent can also be used to identify modules that can be re reused from other ontologies. And uh, commonly in knowledge engineering, this is the point where we identify so-called ontology design patterns that we can reuse. And uh, these ontology design patterns provide predefined structures of classes and properties, which model common recurring aspects. Um, for example, actors, events, or places. And as a result, each time an ontology design pattern is utilized, the same best practices regarding design principles and presumptions about the model domain are reused. So you know, if you have a, um, um, a specific conception about what an historic actor in general should look like and your model is with an ontology design pattern and everyone who reuses this particular ontology design pattern, each one then has the same conception, so to speak, of what a historical actor is. That's the idea. And um, so using this uh, makes the final ontology much more modular in itself. And therefore, of course, much more interoperable and reusable. And uh, I think that in the context of this lecture series, that means preaching to require to reiterate the general challenges regarding historical data, like its ambiguity or incompleteness and temporality. Um, these data properties result in a necessity that we as historians have to define our own models and design patterns for ontology of historical data. But this is, of course, something that many people in this audience are already working towards too. Uh, so uh, myself, as many other ontologies in the historical domain, I reused class and property structures from the CDOC CRM or CIDOC CRM and, um, and ex ex extensions to, to model top level aspects. Like for example, how actors work, how the interconnectedness of um, between spatial and temporal aspects work and so on. And uh, I will elaborate on this further um, when we are talking about the respective modeling decisions for this. Um, so now this leads us to the actual question of this talk on how to model visual sources on murals and how to put them into, into context. So the, the most central classes the ontology is based on are, uh, as you can see here, mural, iconographic feature, and iconographic reference. And icon iconographic feature and iconographic reference are um, intended to represent any visual element that can be identified, named, and differentiated from other ones. Examples for this would be ornaments uh, or images of humans or creatures, or most importantly, of course, coats of arms, as you can see here in the image. Mm. And as I mentioned before, codes of arms are described by another ontology through their specific geometric elements, figures, and colors, uh, as you can see here um, below. And uh, yeah, here, um, codes of arms, as you can also see, are understood as a specialization of all visual items used in a mural. Um, so specialization in this uh, context, if uh, anyone is present who is uh, um, not familiar with this uh, with this kind of, of modeling, uh, this means that uh, a code of arms reference in this case is essentially the same as an iconographic reference, but it has additional properties that make it more distinct and more special from this class here, but uh, that just as a side note. Um, so if we have this, uh, um, yeah, uh, if we understand now, um, uh, or if, if, we, if we conceptualize uh, codes of arms as specializations of all visual items that can be used in a mural, uh, we can analyze them in the visual context of other codes of arms and other imagery, and thereby we can ascertain how heraldry was used on murals particularly. So um, we will uh, dive into codes of arms later, um, but uh, for the classification of uh, things like web of um, non heraldic imagery, I uh, reuse knowledge and results from art historical research as much as possible. So uh, therefore, I, uh, I classify general iconographic um, uh, features by using existing taxonomies and existing assertions about the specific usage of, of these terms uh, on specific murals. So 
necessary taxonomies uh, for example uh, for example i can class all the getty art and architecture thesaurus uh, in this uh, case and it's an i can class uh, example and um now to integrate this into into the ontology of periodic murals i'm re reusing the type assignment pattern from cytox cm and uh, this allows to designate entities with terms from external taxonomies and also this makes it possible to represent which researcher historical source or research paper can re be regarded as the authority of a single type assignment. So you have here, you, in this example, you would here have um, the tendrils ornament um, type, which is a fixed research type I can reuse. And I can um, link this to a particular um, iconographic reference, in this case, this section here in this mural. and uh, Via this structure, I can uh, I can say which researcher, literature, or else um, has uh, has stated that um, these two things have to be linked if I, if I want to and if I want to keep provenance of of such assertions. Um, yeah, and uh, there's of course this uh, has type uh, structure to enable short queries. If I just want to query which type has this, I don't uh, need this part, I can skip it. Um, okay, uh, but uh, please also note uh, for the purpose of this talk, I use the properties from Cytox CIM as much as possible to hopefully make it make more clear to you how all of these classes uh, work together, but uh, just as a side note. Um, so although the goal of my work is not to provide a deep interpretation of non heraldic iconography, um, this modeling structure here allows me to classify these parts of the, of the wall and ceiling paintings and thereby this modeling structure um, provides more semantic context on the iconography of the mural as a whole and more semantic context on how coats of arms were actually used on these on these paintings so in general iconographic features are thereby defined as all identifiable visual elements a mural consists of and the other way around the mural is therefore to be understood as a group of multiple iconographic features and this very loose definition leads to a recursive understanding of the concept mural, meaning that from a modeling perspective, a single wall painting can also consist of other wall paintings. And uh, this makes sense when we, for example, want to differentiate distinct sections of a, of a painted wall or, or ceiling from each other, but also want to describe the overall painted wall as a single entity. And uh, yeah, here in this example, we can, for example, uh, define the periodic freeze, uh, this um, section with coats of arms. Um, we can define this as a sub mural of the overall painting. And then we are able to create assertions in the database that only hold true for only this heraldic section. But we can also create statements on the whole wall painting, which is important in case we are able to link the person who commissioned the painting to the painting itself. Because in most cases, the whole mural would have been commissioned by one person and not just uh, this ornamental section or just this uh, part we see here. Uh, and uh, also in some cases, you, you have the problem that the beams, um, which support here the scene, um, that these beams were sometimes moved or, or rearranged. And if this is the case, we can define each of these beams as a single mural. And we are then able to account for such changes because we can uh, we can ascertain for, for each mural uh, different temporal and different spatial attributes. And um, now this recursive approach of murals that have parts which can be described as single murals from a knowledge engineering perspective as well, um, this approach has another advantage, namely when we are dealing with incomplete data. Because painted walls and ceilings belong to historic monuments that are most difficult to preserve and protect, which has multiple reasons. The, the paint does not last forever, and the existence of a um, painted wall is, of course, inherently linked to the, the existence of the building where, where it is displayed. And also in practice, murals were often painted over in the course of time, and uh, there are, of course, iconoclasms where such monuments were deliberately destroyed. So, we are dealing with a lot of fragments. And uh, to account for this, 
I'm uh, using a subclass of mural uh, and iconographic feature to, to represent fragments of, of, of each and to distinguish them between, uh, between complete murals. Um, so and, uh, in this example here, uh, you, you can see how this structure works. We are dealing with three identifiable fragments that consist of multiple iconographic features. Um, and all these fragments belong to the same mural. And the same goes, of course, oh no, the same goes, of course, for iconographic uh, features, the codes of arms in, in this image. Because as you can see, not all of them are completely preserved. For example, this middle one here, we cannot be sure um, if it once consisted of, of other geometric elements, then only the, the bend we can see in the image. And um, aside from this obvious example, um, this is also important for, for every other uh, coat of arms in this image as well, because often we have the problem of faded colors, which make a complete description of a coat of arms impossible. So uh, you could have uh, such an image, but uh, if you can't identify the colors correctly, it's also a fragment because you cannot um, link a complete description to, to this particular uh, iconographic reference. Okay, um, now we move on to represent spatial context. So with this model I just introduced, we are already able to ascertain which codes of arms, ornaments, and other imagery is depicted on which mural. And at this point, the ontology does not exceed the usability of a taxonomic catalog uh, that only lists which imagery appears on which work of art. And this would, of course, completely suffice if uh, I would just be interested in the question of like where a specific coat of arms is used on which painting it is uh, used. But in my PhD project, I want to go a little further. I would like to call to mind the need to analyze the iconographic structure of the murals, meaning we want to query how coats of arms were used in murals with respect to, to other ones and with respect to, to other imagery. In other words, how was heraldry placed on wall and ceiling paintings. And uh, this is important for multiple reasons um, because visual structures can, of course, represent hierarchies and um, lines of sight for people entering the room have to be considered in some cases. Or in other cases, semantic relations between codes of arms or between iconographic elements can be inferred when they are positioned in a, in a particular way. So therefore, we need to define a way how to model the spatial position of iconographic elements in a mural. And in case of wall and ceiling paintings, we need to do this in a three-dimensional space. So here we have to bring a variety of requirements. Mm. And the visual, visual structure of the painted walls and ceilings should be described semantically enriched and uh, as completely as possible. And uh, I'm seeing the time now, so I'm skipping over that uh, a little bit. You can see here the um, requirements. Uh, but uh, to put this in a more concrete terms, um, these are the uh, concrete requirements on how to how the uh, iconographic elements have to be spatially positioned um, to each other. So we have, uh, in some cases, two fragments of one mural in one room that are, have a spatial relation. And uh, we have um, two iconographic features. And uh, on one mural, and uh, we have uh, two iconographic features on uh, different parts in the same room. So these are the main use cases. Um, so the question is now, of course, how do you, how do we represent something like that with an ontology? And uh, if you formalize all of these uh, requirements in a more general way, we find that they represent already known problems in knowledge engineering. Approaches to model them exist in the shape of so-called meriotopological requirements. Meriotopology being the study of how to define distinct parts and the boundaries between these parts and how these parts are spatially positioned in relation to each other. And uh, this is a subfield of philosophy and knowledge engineering. And uh, it has already defined formal relations that are intended to cover such requirements as I just described, for example, in um, the form of these uh, of the region connection calculus, uh, which formally describes all possibilities to areas can be um, related to spatially related to each other. 
OK, uh, I also have a, an example uh, for this uh, in another discipline. I will not explain now because of time. And, um, but uh, yeah, coming back to heroic murals now, uh, I defined uh, two main properties that um, on the one hand describe the topological and on the other hand describe the directional relation of, uh, of two images to each other. Meaning on the one hand, how are two elements spatially positioned to each other? And on the other hand, how are elements as areas related to each other? Uh, what's relevant here are the sub properties. Um, I will now show how this works uh, with a few minimal examples. Firstly, you can see here the codes of arms in this heroic piece are described as positioned left to each other. And from this, we can, of course, automatically infer, because of, uh, of this hereditary structure, we can automatically infer that they are also next to each other and also right to each other, of course, re respectively. And uh, similarly, we can state that uh, two objects are above or below each other, which in this case also enable us, enables us to position the codes of arms in relation to, to the ornament above. And uh, it is also important to note that uh, these directional and topological properties are intended to be used for iconographic features as well as for murals. So uh, in this case, you have um, uh, separate murals that are opposite of uh, each other. And uh, from this, we can again infer, infer that uh, the elements depicted on these murals are also opposite of each other, of course. And uh, another example uh, how this works on ceiling paintings. Here we have an additional difficulty. We also need to, to consider that the backside of these beams are painted with coats of arms as well, which you can, of course, only see if you would stand at the back of this room here and um, turn around and uh, face the camera. And uh, then you would see. Um, the backside of the beams, which would show other codes of arms. So we can uh, make use of, of these properties here to, uh, to distinguish between, um, between features that are opposite face and opposite averted. So uh, if you would consider this, this particular beam, this code of arms would be opposite averted to the code of arms on the other side of the beam and opposite face to the code of arms on the Beam, which is in front of this beam, if this makes sense. And uh, just two more examples with a focus on the topological relations. Um, above, you can, you can see how codes of arms can be depicted as a so-called proper spatial part of a mural, which means they are completely enclosed. And uh, below, you can see that uh, this uh, extended hereditary structure of the of these um, properties by using RCC8 uh, enables us to better distinguish what the mural exactly shows. So uh, as you can see here, the codes of arms are not fully enclosed by the by the free section of the wall, but instead are sharing their 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 own border with the border of the section. So uh, this is the free section, and you can see they um, have the have the same border. So it's this property here. And uh, finally, at um, this point, when we are talking about areas, we also need to know what next to each other means exactly with regard to areas. Therefore, we are here able to describe if two areas are bordering each other directly or if they are separated by, by other imagery, like it's in the case. Um, especially with regard to these last properties, um, there's of course the challenge of boundary specification. So meaning how do we define which visual elements are distinct from each other and which are not, as well as which elements are connected uh, with each other and which are disconnected. So in this particular case, the decision is relatively easy. Um, this is an example typical for wall paintings of the 14th century. You have quite clearly defined sections, some ornamental section here, and uh, a heraldic frieze. And then comes a less abstract section, uh, depicting figures, for example, from religious scenes or as allegories. And then at the bottom, you have uh, some base section um, often painted as some kind of trompe l'oeil to represent some special kind of masonry or drapery in, in this case. But as you have already seen from the very few examples I showed you, this is not always the case. Such, such sections are not always so easily definable. 
and uh, even here you can see that uh, some of the coats of arms are painted over the borders of the hierarchies. So this means it will be to some degree always an interpretative act, how the relation between two iconographic features is actually defined in ontology. Here it, it is important to point out that the knowledge graph, of course, will not and cannot offer an exact representation of the murals, but rather a critical addition, a collection of newly created digital objects that are recontextualized in their own way based on a certain kind of viewing of these uh, sources. Um, nevertheless, uh, there are ways to mitigate these challenges. Um, one, um, yeah, one could, of, uh, of course, uh, for example, model borders between visual entities explicitly. So uh, this border here would be an object as well in the knowledge graph. And, uh, but such additions would make the knowledge system much more complex, but at the same time, had to deal with the issue of, of interpreting such borders from a knowledge engineering perspective. So this is a question I'm not yet, I all thoughts from you on, on this issue would be of course very welcome. Mm -hmm. But um, all in all, I hope such a merely topological approach offers a way to describe imagery such as painted walls and scenes without having to deal with accurate measurements. This makes the data more accessible to people without a background in geometric analysis. And uh, then aside from individual queries to data, uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative spatial analysis would be an important approach to, to analyze such data. Um, and such an approach would uh, also be able to, uh, to adapt existing historiographic perspective on murals as historic sources. Uh, so one could, for example, easily formalize common visual structures like this periodic freeze um, and thereby look explicitly for them in the whole database. And um, then of course also annotate uh, such, uh, such formal, formal structures. So in other words, you would uh, define a certain query that represents in your view uh, a recurring structure on these sources. And then you could say, okay, this is an, I annotate this query as an interpretation how such data can look like. Okay, now let's uh, get back to the overall model uh, one more time. So, uh, because there's one other last issue we have to talk about. Mm. As you can see, visual elements that are depicted on a, on a mural or on a painted wall are uh, represented via two different classes, which is uh, where which are iconographic reference and iconographic feature. And the reason for this is that the ontology represents a domain at the cross section of historical studies and cultural heritage that deals with monuments, so to speak. And consequently, we are dealing with material, physical aspects of our sources, as well as with the concepts they represent. In other words, we are dealing with entities that have in some way a, a meaning to human actors, which is immaterial. Okay, let me elaborate on this uh, using heraldry as an example. As I um, pointed out in the beginning of my talk, codes of arms were used in a variety of different source contexts and material contexts, and especially the same code of arms were being used, reused in, a, in this variety of contexts. So this means we can uh, find, for example, the coat of arms of, let's say, the King of France on multiple murals and multiple manuscripts and on multiple seals. But we are always talking about the same coat of arms identified by the same combination of colors and geometric patterns, which would be this as an RDF representation and this as a, as a knowledge uh, instance. So no, this is the description of the code of arms is represented through the class uh, DHO, DHO code of arms, you can see here. And instances of this class would be this certain combination that is reusable as a visual item. And this is of course not a physical object. Um, but then now this, um, this code of arms, this um, general combination of, of colors and patterns is actually reused in a variety of historical material contexts. And like I also said in the beginning, 
one coat of arms can have a different meaning depending on the concrete context it is used in. So uh, the coat of arms of the King of France could, for example, represent the king as an individual person, but also France as a kingdom or even the office of the King of France. And consequently, we have to distinguish between the general heraldic description, this one here, and its usage in a specific um, in a specific source. In, a, uh, in this case, which is in this case a, a, a mural, a painted wall. So this specific usage would be, as you can see here, an iconographic reference or a coat of arms uh, reference. Um, in other words, the usage of an identifiable and recognizable, recognizable single object in a particular material context. And this is, of course, uh, the thing um, we as historians are actually interested uh, about, since uh, this symbolic carrier of information is the aspect that is in some way meaningful to the recipients of a mural or any historical source. So it's meaningful to historical persons. Um, so, but these symbolic objects are, of course, only represented to, through material objects. In this case, collections of pigments on a wall uh, what, that are uh, forming an image, for example, a coat of arms. And this distinction um, is something which is also implemented through mapping to the Siloxian classes, uh, human made feature and a symbolic object, respectively, the former describing physical entities, the latter conceptual non-material ones. OK, but this, of course, begs the question why the conceptualization of mural and iconography as material objects is necessary at all, since my main interest lies in the analysis of the mural from the perspective of historical studies, which is focusing on the things that are represented, the non-material things, and not on the material properties of the carrier object. OK, as I explained before, it is essential to have properties that describe the spatial relations between visual items. These were the major topological properties I introduced before. And I would argue that I can only describe the spatial relation between two things if these things are physical and not if they are non-material. Only in the case of physical entities, these entities are taking up an amount of space and are extending over a definable area and only if this is the case, we can compare them spatially by assigning major topological relations. So at least this is my conclusion at the moment. If you are of another opinion, if you would say uh, it is indeed possible and sensible to define spatial relations between conceptual symbolic objects, I would uh, yeah, very, be very interested in your perspectives uh, during the discussions. Um, I think uh, this is an important modeling decision with regard to murals, but also with regard to historical sources in general, when we are interested in their materiality. So where do we draw the line between a material description of a source and the symbolic entities they represent? And this is, of course, a also a question um, studied by advocates of the material term. But again, as often in digital history, we have to deal with such questions way more explicitly if we want to datify our sources. So thank you very much for your attention.